Hi, my name is Exley and I'm from Christ Heritage Church. And while we uh, recognize the providence of God in spreading His gospel message through online videos, uh, this video may be used by God to edify you and to encourage you. But we believe that it is important for a Christian to attend a, to a local church. We believe that it is important for a Christian to be a member of a local church where he can exercise the ministerial gifts given by God. We believe that it is important for a Christian to sit under the preaching of a local pastor. And so the preacher in this video cannot and should not replace the office of the pastor in your, in your local church. Uh, it is our prayer that this video may help you, but again, we strongly insist that you don't miss out in the ordinary means of grace being done in your local church. Thank you. So 59 years ago, exact same day as today, April 12, Russia sent the first man to orbit the Earth. The Russian Yuri Gagarin became a national hero and he, he became a global celebrity uh, because, of, uh, because he was the first man, first human in space. And so again, because of this, he struggled with drinking. Um, his workmates actually became concerned by the uh, amounts of a bottle of drinks he can consume. And they believe that the sudden rise to fame was the reason why he became a drunkard. Unfortunately, uh, this is a classic case of a, a possible addiction to alcohol driven by fame. Now, for God's people, it is not fame that drives them, that drives us to do God's will. And in relation to prayer, it is not fame that drives the Christians to intercede for other saints. What drives every Christian to move, to pray, and to obey God's will is their knowledge about God and God's work. Our passage this morning is uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 16. Ephesians chapter 3 verses 14 to 16 but i will be reading from verses 14 to 19. i'll be reading again from the english standard version for this reason i bow my knees before the father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Next week, we will talk about the content of Paul's prayer, but today, uh, we will talk about what drives him to, to even pray. Um, as we know, we are in the middle of the letter of Paul to the Ephesian church. And this letter uh, is divided into two, just like every uh, one of his letters. The first part being chapters 1 to 3, and the second half is chapters 4 to 6. The first part talks about the doctrines. The second part talks about ethics. The first part talks about what God has done. The second part talks about what we are to do. The first part talks about our standing before God. The second part talks about our conduct toward God and to His people. The first part deals with what we call the indicatives or what enables us to act. The second part deals with the imperatives, our responsibilities to act. And so Paul giving us indicatives or giving us the, the doctrines or the truths in chapter 1 about every spiritual blessing that a Christian has and how also in chapter 2 he tells us how from being dead in our sins and separated from God now we're made alive and we're brought near to God by the blood of Christ by the death of Christ on the cross and so he continues in his, his prayer in chapter 3 verse 14 
that was basically interrupted in verse 1. As you can see in verse 1, chapter 3, it also says, for this reason, but he interrupted himself. And so, from verse 14 to 19, he places this prayer right before he tells us and gives us the practical imperatives in chapters 4 to 6. So right after the indicatives, right after the doctrinal truths, right before the practical steps, right before the imperatives, Paul places this prayer for the church. And take note, this is already his second prayer in his letter to the Ephesians. On his first prayer in chapter 1, he didn't say that he bowed down, uh, but adding what he said in chapters 2 and then in chapters 3, tells us the effect of these truths. In someone who is truly humbled by God's grace, someone who's truly humbled by the glory of God, now he says he bowed down his knee to the Father. Well, I mean, clearly there are effects to knowing such truths. What other effects are there? Upon knowing these doctrinal truths, what are the effects of these indicatives, of these doctrinal truths that led Paul to feel the need even to, act, to seek God's face in prayer? My message this morning is an understanding of God's truth is necessary to be fully dependent upon Him and be confident in His power whenever we intercede for the church. Kapag naintindihan natin yung katotohanan ng Diyos sa salita niya, tayo yung magiging mapagkumbaba at aasa tayo at magtitiwala tayo sa Diyos at sa Kanyang kapangyarihan tuwing tayo yung mamamagitan sa iglesia. Our attitude in prayer should be driven only by the truth of God. If this is not prompted by God's truth, then our prayers, our motives, motives for even praying are questionable. And in this passage, I, I specifically enumerated three things that we must take note of. What drive, what drove Paul in even praying for the Ephesian church? First, our prayers must be driven by God's grace in Christ to produce humility. So humility driven by God's grace in Christ. Second, in our prayers, there must be confidence, the knowledge of God's power through the Spirit. And third, our intercessions must be grounded in Christ's love for the church. So my first point is humility driven by God's grace in Christ. Now, two weeks ago, we talked about the humility of Paul and how having that virtue is necessary for gospel ministry. But now we see this humility manifested through his prayer, to be specific, his posture. For this reason, in verse 14, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. Now, I'm not saying that this is the only appropriate posture when we pray. In fact, it would have been his custom to pray while standing up because that's how Jewish men typically pray. Kneeling is not something that is common to uh, the Jewish Christians, even in Ephesus. Remember in Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, how Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for standing while praying in synagogues. Uh, but Christ rebuked them because they want to be seen. Christ wasn't rebuking those uh, Pharisees because of their posture, because they were standing up. He was rebuking their hearts. Christ was rebuking their hearts. They were standing because they wanted to be seen. So it's not really wrong whether you are praying, lying down, or sitting down, or even walking, or standing up. It's not about the posture of your bodies. It's about the posture of your hearts. So knowing the truths of God's grace should drive us to respond with humility in prayer. We should be humble because we know that it is all by grace. We should be humble because it's not because of our works. This is the effect of the grace of God in the life of Paul, and this should be the effect of the grace of God in our lives. I'm not saying again that you should, that you should always be kneeling down in your prayers. But the question is, 
How did these truths of God's grace shape your hearts? Did these truths change our approach to God? Are we humbled knowing that God made us alive, alive from being dead in sins? Are we humbled knowing that in Christ's death, He bore our sin on the cross and through this work we have redemption? Are we humbled knowing that the Spirit of God continuously even after uh, saving you, after even justifying you, justifying you of your sins, acquitting you, God continuously showers you with strength. And we know that that is only by grace. And since this is grace and not grounded upon anything that you could do, well, for Paul, it resulted to dependence upon the grace of God. I mean, Paul is in prison at this time. But his imprisonment did not stop him to minister to the Ephesian church. He wrote them a letter and he prayed for them, seeking God's help to strengthen them, knowing full well that he doesn't have the power to give them strength, knowing full well that even in his imprisonment, he was still used by God to proclaim God's words through his letter to the Ephesians, knowing full well who, who he was prior being used by God. He was a murderer. Knowing, knowing full well who these people were prior being saved, they were separated from one another, they were separated from God. Knowing full well that it is only by the grace of God that they are who they are now. Paul responded with complete dependence on God. He responded with humility. And for us, this is a struggle. This is a struggle to sinners like us. I mean, let's be honest, when we, whenever we learn about the rich doctrines of God, what was our first response? Did these truths make us proud? What did you do when you first learned about the rich doctrines of grace? Did your understanding of grace manifest in your response? What is your response whenever you're confronted of your sins and always being brought to the cross of Christ? If your heart is not changed, if your heart is not humbled by Christ's substitutionary work on the cross, if you're not humbled by the fact that your sin was imputed to Christ, if you're not humbled by the truth that you have been sinning against God, and you were you who were supposed to be obedient to the law of God, yet Jesus Christ in his life actively obeyed and fulfilled the law of God in behalf of sinners. If you are not humbled by the truth that the wrath of God is supposed to be poured out on us sinners. Yet it was poured on Christ. Satisfying the wrath by dying on the cross. If you are not humbled by the truth, that gospel truth, then you should examine your lives. You should repent of this pride and turn to Christ. In fact, if you are, are joining us today and if you have not repented of your sins or if you haven't put your faith in Christ, if you have not believed that Jesus Christ's atonement on the cross is in behalf of you as a sinner, that it is supposed to be you who's, to, uh, who's supposed to receive the wrath of God and not Christ, then you should repent of your sins and come to Christ. So if you owe someone a million dollars and that person forgives you and that person cancels your debt completely at one million dollars and if ever there came a situation wherein you needed money again and the only one who can provide that money is the person who canceled your previous debt what's going to be your attitude when you approach that person again who previously extended grace in our case, our debt has been paid for by Christ. God wiped our slates clean by the death of Christ. Yet, we who were humbled by God's grace are to seek more graces from God to be strengthened by God. Shouldn't we then approach God in humility? The challenge for us is to remind ourselves of our need of Christ. And to always look at the humility of Christ. Lagi ba natin naalala yung pangangailangan natin kay Kristo? O tingin natin, hindi natin siya kailangan. 
if the effect of God's grace is pride, that we don't understand grace. If it doesn't change your heart, or even let you bow your knees to our Lord, then worse than not understanding grace, you may have not experienced grace. If God's grace does not drive you to pray and acknowledge that, that father-son-daughter relationship that we now have, that we now enjoy, because of the death of His own Son, Jesus Christ, then examine yourself. Repent of that pride of yours. And look at the humbling work of the suffering servant that is Jesus Christ. If your prayers are not prompted by God's grace, if your prayers are not prompted by the gospel of Christ, if you only pray when you're prompted by your mood or whenever there's problems in your life, examine the content of your prayers. Are they not always about yourself? I mean, nothing wrong about praying for your needs. But a Christian who only prays when he is prompted by his mood will never grow in his prayer life. And let's say you pray for others. And you have no understanding of the grace of God. Then you might be showing false humility. And we're talking about humility here that is grounded upon truth. A humility that is driven by none other than the grace of God. You know, Hudson Taylor, Hudson Taylor was a missionary in China. And he was known for many of his achievements. Um, he had a lot of missionaries under his wing, under his ministry. And there were a lot of Chinese converts uh, as fruits uh, of his ministry. Now, there's one time when he was asked by his wife if he was ever tempted to be proud because of his many accomplishments, because of his many uh, achievements. Now, Hudson Taylor was surprised by that question. Uh, Hudson Taylor said, proud about what? And his wife said, about all the things you've done. And then Taylor responded with a simple statement, I never knew I had done anything. I mean, that is the key to understanding the grace of God. If we put even an ounce of merit if we even think that it is because of us, then we are in danger of being proud. Let us always look to the grace of God realized in Christ Jesus. So Paul kneels humbly before the glory of God and calls God his Father. And while he obviously doesn't have any personal right to call, his, to call God his Father, yet he shows us his confidence in doing so. And that is my second point. Confidence, knowledge of God's power through the Spirit. See how he says in verse 9 that God is the creator of all things. Chapter 3, verse 9. And he approaches the creator of all things, the one whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. He is the one who names or defines the identity of all creatures, even to the extent of naming every family in heaven and on earth. It shows us an affirmation of His power, shows us an affirmation of His sovereignty over all creation, how He is in control of every living thing by actually even naming every one of them. But at the same time, Paul tells us that while God has that rule, while God has that authority over all creation, God is a father to Paul. Paul has that intimate father-son relationship with God Almighty. And this access to the Father gives Paul confidence to come to Him in prayer with petitions. But this access that Paul had should be traced back so we'll know where it came from. Remember that in chapter 1, verse 19, how Paul describes the immeasurable greatness of God's power by, by how he raised Christ from the dead. And this same power also in chapter 2 uh, that, raised, that raised the Christians up with Christ. This same power evidenced by Christ's work from him being dead to being raised up is the same power evidenced by the Spirit's regeneration in also making alive dead men like Paul and the Ephesian church, like us. 
And so this is why Paul responds with confidence in his prayers. Same thing for us. Our knowledge of the power of God through the Holy Spirit's work rooted in Christ's death and resurrection should drive us to respond with confidence in our prayers. Note that the root where this conf confidence comes from is in chapter 3 verses 11 to 12 where he was explaining to the Ephesian church his ministerial work of preaching the gospel. And in verse 11, it says that it was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. What makes us confident in approaching the Father in our prayers is Jesus Christ himself. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18 tells us, For through Christ, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Through the power of God in the work of Christ, we have confidence in our standing before God. We have confidence that we can approach our Father who is sovereign, who is holy, who is powerful, who is gracious. And just like Paul, how Paul prays to the Ephesian church for God to grant them to be strengthened with power, that same power led Paul to be confident, knowing full well that this power changed him, knowing full well that this power can also change and strengthen the Ephesian church. He's confident because he knows the power of God and what God is capable of. He knows who God is. You know, when we go out today, when we go out today to buy some groceries, uh, we should be wearing masks uh, because we don't know whom we will encounter outside. Of course, we need to protect ourselves and we need to protect others. Uh, we can't be too confident in just going out without wearing any masks because you don't know if there's someone who may be a carrier or you don't know if that carrier is asymptomatic. You don't know if you yourself may be a carrier, may be a uh, carrier of uh, the virus and you may possibly infect others. So we're not that confident yet to go out and approach others and not wear protections like masks because we don't know who may be carrying the virus within our area we have the opposite thing in our case we do know about God we do know about his capability we do know about his power we do know about his redemptive work in Christ so we can be confident in approaching our father and in our prayers we should be constantly reminded of the power of God that gives us confidence whenever we pray for God's graces through the Holy Spirit we can be confident in our prayers because we know that our God is a powerful God. We know that because He raised Christ. We know that because we too were raised. And so when we pray for the church to be strengthened with God's power, to be enabled by Him, then we should be confident in what God can do and what God is capable of doing. Paul was confident in his prayer for the Christian church. He prayed that God would grant them spiritual strength, that God would continue to dwell in them. And for us, before even we pray for our church and for other churches to receive such graces, let us remind ourselves of the power of God in doing these things. Let us remind ourselves of the power of God as shown in what Christ has done and how He has saved us. And from that, from that gospel truth, draw the same confidence that Paul also had. Confidence in our standing before God. Confidence in calling God our Father. Confidence that we have access to God because of Jesus Christ and His work on the cross. Now, are we confident in approaching our Father in prayer? Or do we know do, do we now know what our Father is capable of? Or are we sometimes arrogant, thinking that we deserve to be answered by God in some petitions that we have not received? Let us draw a God-given confidence in approaching our Father's, our Father in prayers. Now I have to beware 
not to become one of those who are overconfident that in their prayers invoking the name of Christ by shouting in Jesus name thinking that by doing so may produce from themselves power that shouting in Jesus name is like a magical incantation as if by declaring things to happen it will happen that is overconfidence that is arrogance and that is abusing the name of Christ beware of those who abuses the name of Christ by using his name to declare in their prayers or to declare healing over the sick instead of a humble plea to God for not just physical healing but spiritual healing instead of a God enabled confidence of asking God to grant both physical and spiritual healing you know in one of the Puritan prayers in the Valley of Vision this prayer was written at a time of persecution it says you have shown boundless compassion towards me by not sparing your son and by giving me freely all things in him this is the foundation of my hope the refuge of my safety the new and living way to you the means of that conviction of sin brokenness of heart and self despair which will endear to me the gospel Happy are they who are Christ's, in Him at peace with you, justified from all things, delivered from coming wrath, made heirs of future glory. See, the Puritans' confidence in their prayer at the time of suffering. Their confidence is drawn from their knowledge about the power of God in the gospel of Christ. In 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 to 15, John tells us that not only that we as Christians should draw confidence knowing the power of God, but also we should have confidence in asking God only if we ask anything according to His will. And that is what Paul was praying for, God's will. And we can see that in his intercession for the church and that is my last point intercession grounded in Christ's love for the church and so Paul didn't pray for him for himself to be freed from prison I mean he even acknowledged himself as a prisoner of Christ he didn't ask specifically for food or shelter I mean uh, at least it's not written I mean he could pray for strength for himself well it's of course, it's not bad to do so, but he didn't, he didn't do that. Paul prayed that God would grant the Ephesian church to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in their inner being. For them to be strengthened spiritually, to be rooted and grounded in love, so that Christ's love may dwell in them, that they may have strength to comprehend the love of Christ, and that in Christ they may be filled with all the fullness of God. Paul wants them to know the love of God in Christ to the end, that they, may, that they might be all that God wants them to be, that they may be spiritually mature in Christ. But why was Paul praying for these? Remember, this is in the middle of the letter. Before he writes the second half, full of imperatives, full of to-dos. In fact, in chapter 4, the word therefore, that's the clause uh, that starts the imperatives. I urge you, it says. And so Paul prays for these because he recognizes that the Ephesian church, the church, needs the enabling grace of God in order to obey the word of God. They need the strength provided by the Spirit to be able to perform and obey the imperatives in the next words he would write in this letter. They need the strength of God to walk in a manner worthy of their calling. They need to understand the love of Christ in order to love the saints. Because that is the, that is the most of the imperatives are for the love for the saints. And Paul shows that same love of Christ as well by praying for them. And of course, he knows their needs. He knows their needs because he knows the will of God. He says in verse 17, So that 
Christ may dwell in your hearts. The phrase so that tells us that it is the purpose of, of, of God for Christ to dwell in their hearts. He knows what he's praying for. And he prays according to the riches of his glory. He prays according to the will of God. He doesn't just pray to God as if God was a genie where he can get what he wants. I mean, if all of our prayers are like that, whether it be intercession for the saints or even to the lost, if we treat God as someone who does what we wish for and not according to his will, if we do so, then we're, we are all like the unbelieving world. Yes, even the unbelieving world prays. Even those in false religion, false religions pray. They don't generally pray for bad things to happen, of course. They ask their God, they ask their God to do good things without asking him to do the best thing. Of course, for us we are commanded to ask for the best thing. And that best thing is the will of God. And for the unbelievers, they pray as though God were always the giver, but not the gift. Petitions such as protection, food, shelter, physical health, prosperity, peace, comfort, happiness, social justice, that's it. It ends there. Ano pinagkaiba ng mga dasal natin sa mga ito? Those are the usual prayers of even those who are not believers of Christ. What is the difference in their prayers to ours? Examine our prayer life. Are we praying according to the will of God? Are we praying for the spiritual strength of the churches? Are we praying for salvation for the lost? We may have been praying for the good things, but are we praying for the best thing, which is God's will? And when we pray for those who need shelter, let's say we're praying for those who doesn't have any shelter, that God would grant them shelter. Do we pray for a shelter for both their physical body and, sp uh, and spiritual body? Their need of a shelter from rain, yes. To be protected from calamities, yes. But are we praying for them to be protected from the unending destruction that comes from unbelief? When we pray for the basic needs of people like clothing, do we also pray for them to be clothed by the righteousness of Christ? When we pray for the provision of food, do we pray that God may grant them the knowledge about the food that endures eternal life that only Christ can give us? Do we pray that they may be fully dependent upon the bread of life, the only one that satisfies us spiritually? And when we pray for healing, especially at this time, when we pray for healing for those people who are sick, do we just pray that God would grant them good health, that God would grant them physical healing? There's nothing bad about that. But do we also pray that God would provide them full and eternal healing that would go well with their physical health and even more so with their souls? Sabi nga ni John in 3 John chapter 2. Verse 2, rather. And so in our intercessions, we should be aiming for what is best for others, for unbelievers, salvation, for our fellow saints, strength for them to always be enabled by God. They cannot do the will of God. For the saints, they cannot do the will of God if God does not enable them. And so we are to pray that God may grant them the strength. And God uses us as means to fulfill His purpose. And He uses our prayers to fulfill these purposes and His will. You know, you can flip a switch, but it's not you who provides the electricity. You can turn on a faucet, but you don't make the water flow. There won't be any light, there won't be any water without someone else providing it. So it is also for us Christians. For the light to come on, for the water to flow, we need the provider the enabler of grace. That is why we need to pray to God for us and for others to be enabled by God, to be strengthened by God to do His work. That is the challenge for us today. It is for us to pray for one another 
and to be enabled by God's strength to perform our Christian duties. This is God's will for the Christians to be able to proclaim the grace of God and to show the love of Christ toward one another. And in order to do that, they need the strength of God through His Spirit. Do you pray for your fellow saints? Is Christ's love evident in your prayers? Are you seeking what's best for them? Mahal mo ba yung mga kapwa mo para lagi kang mam, uh, mamagitan sa kanila sa pagdasal? Pinagdarasal mo ba na lagi silang palakasin ng Diyos? That they will love one another? That their faith will be strengthened? That their faith in God would be restored? If lost? Or if it wavers rather? You know, Jonathan Edwards, uh, he wrote a document or a treatise uh, advocating the establishment of regular prayer meetings in their church and in their neighboring churches. So that treatise or that document was providentially handed down to uh, Andrew Fuller. Now, Andrew Fuller, uh, he was convinced, he was so convinced by Jonathan Edwards' work about uh, his document or his um, uh, treatise or thesis about uh, prayer. Fuller was so convinced that he believes that without prayer, Christians would grow Im- impotent in their spiritual advance. Now, we know Andrew Fuller is a friend of uh, William Carey who was a missionary. And Fuller uh, supported William Carey in his missions. Fuller uh, was known to be holding the ropes, quote, holding the ropes so Kerry can go down into the pit, so he can go into ministry, into his missionary work. Now, he did help Kerry to, uh, by raising funds. Uh, that's why he was called to be holding the ropes of William Kerry. He was, uh, Andrew Fuller was raising funds for William Kerry. But most notably, as influenced by Edwards, Andrew Fuller held the ropes by praying fervently and regularly for William Carey. This is the love of Christ being shown by saints who love one another through prayer and support. We should approach God in our prayers, humbled, knowing what the grace of God has done in Christ. We should approach God in our prayers, calling our God Our Father, confident, knowing what the power of God has done in Christ, knowing what it did to us. And these virtues should lead us to pray for others. We pray for the will of God. We pray for the lost to be found. We pray for the found ones to be fed, to be strengthened. You see, our knowledge of the scriptures should drive us to have these virtues should drive us to be humble, should drive us to be confident, should drive us to be interceding for others, to be praying for God's will, to be praying according to the will of God, to show them the love of Christ, imitating the love of Christ by extending the love of Christ through prayer. Our knowledge of the scriptures, doctrinal truths, is not an indicator of spiritual maturity. And if we find ourselves just attracted to these doctrinal truths, just like Paul has presented in chapters 1 to 3, if we find ourselves gravitated or attracted to these truths, while we neglect praying for the church, having humility because of His grace, having confidence in His power, then we must point ourselves to the gospel of Christ. For the gospel pictures humility in Christ's life. For the gospel gives us confidence in His work on the cross. And the gospel leads us to love others just like how Christ loved the church. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, O Lord, for your word.
we thank you that you've given us the gospel. But this gospel message, this knowledge about the person of Christ, that his deity, his humanity, that he lived a life of complete obedience to your law, and he died to pay the payment, to be the sacrifice, to be the satisfaction of the wrath of God in our behalf. This gospel truth, O oh Lord, oh, we pray that this should constantly drive us to be prayerful, that, should, that this should drive us to have an attitude of humility, that it would change our hearts, that we will always look at the grace of God remembering who we were apart from Christ and remembering how we were made alive together with Christ. And Lord, may this gospel truth, may your power that raised Christ from the dead remind us of our standing before God that because of our standing, O oh Lord, we have confidence in approaching our God, our Father. We have confidence as well asking our Father anything according to His will. And the oh Lord, may this gospel truth lead us and drive us, O oh Lord, to always be interceding for others, to always be loving for others, and that this love would manifest in our prayers. That we would always want the best for them. That we would want the will of God in their lives. That they would be strengthened in their faith. That their souls would be replenished. That, they would be grant, that you would grant them strength. Through your Spirit's power. That they would not waver in their faith. That they would persevere, O oh Lord. May this gospel truth change our hearts, change our attitudes in prayer. Thank you, O Lord, for Christ and for what He has done on the cross. For the gospel, O Lord, shows us Christ's humility. For the gospel shows us His love for the church. We too, as followers and disciples of Christ, so we too should show that love. And that love should be shown first in our prayers. Lord, thank you for the truths that we have learned this morning. We pray all this in Jesus Christ's mighty name. Amen. Amen.